Yeah, throw a save as well. Are we good? We're good to go. Let's do it. Right, here goes. So, welcome to series one of Pod Talks. We've got uh, some more episodes to talk about today. As always, I'm here with my trusted lieutenant, uh, Mr. Tom Davies. Hello. Tom, how are you? Good to be here again. I'm incredibly well. Thank you, Greg. Excellent. And how's your month been, work life wise and personal? It's, been, personal-wise? it's been terrific. We've enrolled lots of students at Kit McGrath <laughs> Education in the north of England, um, and we're thoroughly enjoying that. Nothing more interesting than you just keep driving your business. Well, 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 that's it. I've got some. Uh, I've got some factoids for Ooh, us shortly, so but we'll we'll hear more okay. about that soon. And more importantly, we have with us today one of our guest speakers, in Mr. Matt Lynch. Matt, welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for having me. Excellent. You're welcome. It's great to have you here today as well. We're going to have some fun between the three of us, and we're going to talk everything people, organisation, development. So. First and foremost, before we get into the nitty gritty with Matt on his background, and we've got some specific questions on, on what he can offer you guys as viewers, depending on what position you are within your role, be it if you're unemployed, all the way through to a chief exec, we've got some fascinating things to talk about. However, to get us going, as always, we have Mr. Tom Davies, and we've got some people, organisation development factoids. What have we got this month for we, us, Tom? We have indeed. Well, moving on from a previous episode where we talked <laughs> about profits and productivity, we're going to look at employee retention Ooh. and how proper development can aid retention of key employees. So if we look at some recent research, we can see that in a survey of 400 employees that spans three generations, our baby boomers, Generation X and millennials, 70% of the respondents indicated that job-related training and development opportunities influence their decision to stay in the job. So the millennials have most significant results with 87% of them citing access to professional development or career growth opportunities as being very important to their decision of whether to stay or go. Wow, that's really interesting, isn't it? And there's some statistics out there that say by 2020, 50% of the workforce are going to be millennials. Yeah. So actually what millennials are saying to the employer in these days is you need to give something back. You need to make sure you help us evolve, develop, learn, this, that and the other. So they're actually embracing that more than any other generation. Is that right? I, I agree with that. I echo that. And as a kicker, there was a research project commissioned by Middlesex University for work-based learning. They found that from 4,300 wor- a worker sample, 74% felt they weren't achieving their full potential at work due to lack of development opportunity. So I don't know if that's a bleak statistic or um, a real indicator of opportunity in that arena. So I'll leave that with you too. Really interesting, isn't it? So, you know, it's really saying that actually we all want to develop and learn, which is quite an interesting aspect in today's society, considering other generations might not have wanted that. But actually, it, there's so much knowledge at our fingertips. I guess what we're asking for, particularly the millennials, they're trying to funnel into what do I need to know and I want to do that, what I need to know really, really well. Really interesting. So, And also, as we said uh, previous, we've got quite an interesting time in the workplace with that generation clash of different generations trying to put together and work together, right? Sure is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Big smile there from our guest speaker. So moving on to Matt. So delighted to have you here. And I think first and foremost, before we get into the nitty gritty of the three questions, is just for you to share with our viewers a little bit about you, um, your background, personal and, and or professional, and tell us about your journey of, of why you sat here today and where did it all start for you? Yeah, so I mean, I'll go back to, um, you know, my university years, which, um, you know, from when I was about 17, went to university, College of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I, don't have an, I don't have a Southern accent because I'm, I'm Canadian born. Uh, but my parents, who uh, my dad's from England, my mom's from Ireland, uh, brought us from Canada to uh, the Midlands of South Carolina when I was uh, seven years old. So that was an interesting, I think, uh, transition for all of us. I do think that was an important part of my, um, my learning and the ability to adapt to environments, um, which, which we had to do uh, in that, that, um, that time in 1985. But university, went to College of Charleston. Um, I was a media communications major. Um, I worked throughout my university years, and actually in my senior year, I uh, had a, a full-time job, 40 hours a week. I was working um, while taking classes and finishing out my, my education. I worked at a golf course. Uh, so I woke up really early in the morning and went and picked balls on the range in the, uh, the, uh, 
that cart thing where the members are hitting balls at you yeah. and you're did you you're get paid to, well or was that back in the day where you no you definitely did not get paid well <laughs> um yeah I, I would say it was probably maybe eight bucks an hour wow. eight dollars an hour but it, at the golf club actually was a real perk for employees is they mm -hmm. always provide you with uh, meals mm -hmm. so you always got a meal um at the club which i, I thought was a, a great uh, a great perk um, mm. but while i was in university i did a lot of um, internships as we call it in the united states so i worked at uh, the north charleston coliseum which was um, kind of like an, um, an arena we had a hockey team minor league hockey team so i worked i worked there um, i also spent time with the walt disney company um, they have an internship program called the college program where you go you leave university and you go uh, work uh, in uh, a theme park in Orlando and so I did that uh, for two semesters I I went to Epcot first and mm -hmm. worked in uh, what's called the future world which I won't get into <laughs> but uh, yeah and uh, actually when I got you get chose chosen to go uh, to Disney and you, know, you go through this rigorous interview program to just get into the program um, and when uh, when you get through that, they say, okay, well, this is what your role is, right? You don't apply for a role. They tell you what your role is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got through it, they said, okay, so your role is going to be a custodian. So your job is going to be to pick up, pick up trash or rubbish, as we say <laughs> over here. And, you know, so that's perfectly fine. I get to walk all day and pick up rubbish. But when I did get to Disney, they said, you know what? We changed your role. You're not going to be a custodian anymore. You're going to be a, um, a ride operator. And so I ended up basically just giving spiels on rides about safety and about the experience and that type of stuff. So um, that was an important part of my, my journey. And I look back on my, you know, on my career and I really, I, that opportunity to go work at Disney when I was very young was really important. And um, I think as I look back now, you kind of see where there was crossroads in your, in your life uh, especially in career, and that was definitely one of them. Um, mm. And I would, if I wouldn't have had that experience, then after I graduated from university, I think it was two weeks later, I moved to London. Uh, I didn't have a job or the right to work here at the time. Okay. Uh, I had applied for an Irish passport through my mom. Um, so I landed on the ground with no money. Uh, I had a second cousin who said I, I could stay with him. Um, and Lion King was coming, so I knew mm -hmm. Lion King was going to be there, so they would have to give me a job, <laughs> which actually didn't mm. pan out that way. Uh, I still went through an interview and all that type of stuff, but, um, you know, then having that opportunity to open Lion King in London, which is now 20 years ago, um, and, and so that, you know, that was an integral part, but it goes back to my, my time of uh, internship at, at Walt Disney. And actually, anytime I meet university students, that they have, and even in England and in Europe, you have that opportunity to go work um, at the uh, at the Walt Disney World Resort. Mm. I say you should take that. I learned more working there in that year time mm. um, than I think I probably learned in university, just about how things work and how things should work, and the focus on the guest and the focus on the customer and. Uh, how you treat your employees and how you make them feel valued and cared for. Um, so I, that was a real important uh, part. And eventually, I had to go back to the United States um, and start paying my student loan, as you mm. do. So I spent about three years working on Lion King, then went back to the U.S. And interesting enough, I thought I was on top of the world and I couldn't find a job mm. anywhere. Um, so I, I took a job working at Turner Broadcasting, which was CNN and uh, you know TNT, a lot of entertainment networks, and I was. Uh, I think I've told you this before, I got offered, a, uh, they had a temp department, I said, well, I can get in through this temp mm -hmm. department, and they said, we have two jobs that you can pick from, you can either, uh, you can fix photocopiers, or you can be a CNN tour guide, and I was like, I'll be a tour guide. <laughs> tour guide, please. I think I made a lot more sense for my personality anyway, so, um, so I went and was yeah. a tour guide for about three months, and then the... Then they offer another position. Okay, now you can go um, schedule cartoons at Cartoon Network. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm good. I, I can do that. I'll go do that. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of the basis of my my early uh, career. Now, eventually, I ended up at the baseball team, which is the Atlanta Braves. They're still yes. wearing their gear. Come on, Red Sox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in a good we're in good shape right now. Um, so I spent um, a number of years working in stadium operations, which I think was back into kind of where I wanted to be. 
Um, and my role really was about that frontline uh, staff member and making sure that we were picking the right people to work at the ballpark to take care of our guests, but it was also about taking care of the staff member, making sure that they, they felt um, a connection to who we were and, and what we wanted them to do every single day. In baseball, there's a lot of baseball, so uh, you do have that consistency of workforce, which is great, and people and getting to know those people. So um, yeah, I spent a number of years, six years uh, with the team. Um, and then uh, I went and opened up the College Football Hall of Fame in downtown Atlanta. It was uh, mm-hmm. something that was built. Um, so from construction, I was on that team, on the leadership team, to uh, start to define what the guest experience should be like there. And then, um, and then Wembley called, and, which was int- an interesting phone call. Wembley uh, Stadium, the FA, called to um, come over to England and, and uh, assist with the guest experience at Wembley Stadium. So that's kind of my career in a nutshell, I would mm. say. I'm sure I missed something, but... And, and we'll talk more about what you're currently doing with, with your own organization and, and where, where that's developed to and, and how you got to that point, which is, which is an incredible story in itself. And, but just going back on your background a little bit, I think there's two things that spring to my mind, which was the diversity of your upbringing. So you talked there about you know, Canada, the US, the UK, Ireland, you know, and, and that's obviously you've, you've been moved around. So you've had to learn new cultures quite quickly, haven't you? And you've had to adapt. And I think the second thing in my mind that came up was from a skill set for, in particular, our younger audience who are listening into this, thinking, oh, "How do I need to get there?" It sounded like you were very adaptable and flexible because of then different roles that came out. You weren't really very picky. You just thought, "Okay, well, I want to get a bit of income. I want to do this." And bear in mind, your you, uh, uh, degree was media, right? So, I, I think that's a lot of volume, volume to explore and discuss a little bit further. So it's something we can tap into. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? So I think what we'll do now then is just go into a little bit more then. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So we've got three questions for our guest speaker, Matt. And I know Tom's dead excited for question two, which is the nitty gritty of what you're doing now. And we'll come on to that very shortly. And you sort of slightly touched on this in what you just said with the background. But if I could just ask you again, so far in your time, throughout that whole time from when you were 17 all the way to where you are now, what's been your personal and professional career highlights do you think so it can be one or two or three or four what's what's really stood out for you yeah I mean I, I think um, I, I, I often look back at my time at Disney even when I was I think I was 19 at the time and that that opportunity to work at Disney even at 19 I would have said was a career highlight for me because I think that's what changed the direction in which I went and so just being a frontline cast member at, at the Walt Disney World Resort and what I learned in that time that I was there is, is a is a um, is a highlight for me and I look back mm-hmm. on that still today and say you know that that was a crossroads and that that's what kind of sent me in a, a certain direction. In did my, you know that at the time or is that something that's just been a reflection? Yeah, I did absolutely did not know that at the time. Mm-hmm. No, I mean it, it's a it's a it's a fun internship. You live. With other interns, you you know you work the evening shifts, mm-hmm. right? Because the the cast members that work there every day don't want to work those evening shifts; they want to work the morning shifts. Yeah. Um, so no, and while I was there, I just you know I was just being a cast member and, and trying to execute what you learn in traditions about mm-hmm. taking care of the guests and trying to go out of your way to make sure that they have a great experience and the the responsibility that comes mm-hmm. with that. I would say that. It was definitely a responsibility that I felt working uh, at Disney World. Um, but no, I did not at the time think, wow, this is going to change my life. I was just thinking, uh, you know, I was 19 or 20 years old, so uh, we were having a lot of fun and, uh, you know, met a lot of great people who I'm mm-hmm. still friends with today. Um, so, yeah, I would say looking back on it now, you could see the crossroads while I was there was, was uh, just, uh, you know, another another experience so it gave you that grounding for yourself it gave, gave you the opportunity to express yourself but also it gave you the skill sets that you've used throughout your career so would you say that's a personal and professional sort of career highlight or yeah absolutely merged together yeah absolutely I mean I you know you look back on things I think in your life and uh, you know like I said a lot of, a lot of people uh, some of my roommates mm. a lot of people that I met while I was at Disney I'm still really good friends with really close with as well as it being a, uh, an important part of my career 
um, even though I was only an intern at the time. Mm. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so I think what's really intriguing now, we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of what you do here today, which is great, and thanks for sharing. It's great to see the background of, you know, and, and your personal career highlights, a lot of it was embedded in, in Disney, what it sounds like. And so maybe Tom will start from Wembley days through to, to now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, Disney's fascinating brand that kind of permeates almost every childhood life and you know adult to an extent in in the UK so that for us is a great point of reference really I mean moving on to Wembley like Graham's mentioned here um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the work there and also when you went in there what you were aiming to achieve and how that panned out as well so maybe it's a starting point yeah I mean I, I think um, you know I'll be honest about my experience with Wembley I mean there's you know I I uh, as a kid, my grandfather, who was um, British, used to come over and see that. I don't think I met him until I was probably um, maybe 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he came over, he brought this program, this Live Aid program mm -hmm. yes. from Wembley. Cool. And I remember he gave it to us, and I always remember that. And then later on in you know, life, I'm getting a call from Wembley. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it, that at the FA actually owned the stadium. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, you just think about the iconic nature mm -hmm. of that stadium. And so it was a bit of a no-brainer to uh, accept mm -hmm. that uh, that position and, and and move over, you know, to um, the UK again. From my background of moving before, and mm -hmm. my parents were from from Europe, it wasn't a huge uh, issue. But still, you're moving your life, and I have two kids, and um, and so moving over um, to take that role, which was head of guest services at Wembley Stadium, was a was a huge. A huge thing for me and especially when you work in stadiums and uh, that industry you know Wembley um, is the most iconic stadium in my opinion mm. in the world um, its history its legacy its traditions uh, are really important now when I got on the ground uh, it was a bit of an eye-opener mm. there was no doubt about it I came from um, you know I came from the Braves the Turner Field where all of our staff you know, go through very uh, strict um, <laughs> application procedures, yeah. uh, selection processes, as we call them, yeah. where they're actually being selected to come work for the team. Mm. Uh, and people take a lot of pride in that. And there's staff members that have been working there for 15, 20, 50 years. And you walk into Wembley and it's like nobody is mm. uh, a regular, right? Mm. Everybody's transient. Mm. Uh, there's, you know, you go to a, a block or an aisle and you think, well, Jimmy should be here again today and Jimmy's not there, right? Now it's somebody else. And so it was a real challenge for me. And I think, um, you know, I was with, uh, with Wembley about 18 months, right? And I think the challenge was is that the culture or even the organization wasn't ready to kind of make that next step. I think they thought this next step was to bring me there, mm -hmm. but really the next step was to start to look at their front line mm -hmm. and say, who's here to welcome those people when they come here, right? Mm -hmm. Who's here to welcome the FA Cup, mm -hmm. you know, finals fans and mm -hmm. who, who's here to take care of those people. And I think it just wasn't ready to take that next step. And I think uh, that's why I, I found it very challenging um, there because it wasn't, uh, I wasn't really in a strategic role, I was in a very tactical role, which mm. is, you know, dealing with challenges that your guests have when they tell you because they've been already and we weren't there to take care of them properly mm -hmm. from the get-go. So my time at Wembley, I mean, I think uh, is one of those things I look back on now that, and, and probably still uh, have a, a, a yearning to go back there and do it the mm. right way mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't it wasn't ready at the time and you want to you want to make sure that you know your perception when you came you want to make sure you try and fulfill that perception which is customer excellence so so talk us through I mean that was a challenging time right coming from the Atlanta Braves coming to um, uh, Wembley Stadium as head as guest services talk us through that challenge how did you cope with that and deal with that from a, a people and actually an organizational perspective well, you know, I, I tried to manage what I could manage, right? Which is, um, you know, we built um, the Wembley Connectors team. We built a great accessible program to take care of our accessible guests and make sure that they were having a, a what I would 
expect a world-class experience. You're at a world-class stadium. Mm -hmm. You're in an iconic stadium. You should have the best uh, accessible experience in the world, right? And I think we uh, we got pretty close uh, to that. We implemented a lot of great things that currently still exist. I was even talking to some uh, staff that are there, and I've been gone a couple of years now, and they said, you know, your your accessible program is still, you know, um, mm. still going strong. So, you know, you want to leave a legacy in anything that you do, I think, uh, I would say, we all feel that, even though we might not say that's what we're trying to do, but we're trying to leave a legacy. We're trying to leave something that, that keeps going on, a sustainable past when you're there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's, uh, I, I still feel that the Braves, that that still exists, the legacy of, um, you know, staff focus and guest focus and the, uh, the staff member um, take, making sure we're taking care of them. That still exists at the Braves, even though I'm long gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at Wembley, it's about the accessible program. It's about the Wembley connectors. Um, you know, I was there uh, last week to see the Who mm -hmm. uh, and Pearl Jam. And when you walk up to Wembley, there's these one of those um, signs, right? With a you know, and, and uh, when I got to Wembley, it was just kind of this the same sign that sits there. It was just very uh, functional, right? It would mm -hmm. say like you know, uh, bag checks and stuff. Just very like you know things that. Not, are not very inspirational. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, it should say, hello, Wembley. Mm. It should say, welcome to iconic Wembley, right? Mm. And so they changed the sign, yeah. and it still exists now. So if you do yeah. walk up to Wembley, a little small thing, yeah. you know, that just, that I mm. felt should be there is the messaging of, because people are journeying to this place. Don't forget mm. that, right? Just like Walt Disney World, people are making a journey with their kids to this place, and we should be there to welcome them, not just tell them, you know, that you need to have your bag ready and that there's mm -hmm. going to be bag checks and that, you know, it's going to take 20 minutes to get through the line or this is where the ticket office is. Uh, it's about, you know, celebrating their their journey and it should say, welcome to Iconic Wembley. It should say, um, you know, thanks for thanks for coming today and spending some time with us. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's what I'm and, and what's, sorry Tom, just, um, just on that point, you made me think about uh, function versus purpose and, and I think um, it's quite a really interesting insight to that isn't it so we all have a role in general terms when we're in the workplace which is functional and then we always look for that purpose which is the values and obviously the vision this that and the other and it's quite interesting to see how organisations um, prefer one or the other and, and organisations that are trying to get the, the mix the balance of that Talk us through a little bit from your perspective, give us a bit of insight to what that really means, this function purpose stuff in the workplace, when, particularly when you're working on events or through your career, and then how, how organisations can or should adopt if they're not already in that situation. Yeah, I mean, if you're working, I, mean, I would say, if you're working in an environment that's just uh, function driven, then probably uh, a lot of your workforce is, is not getting a lot out of that, right? And I think you have to start uh, no matter how big or small your organization is, you have to start with purpose. You have to start with how are we inspiring people to deliver whatever we're trying to deliver here. And so the organizations I've worked in that have done that really well, of course, are Disney, mm -hmm. right? And they, when you go work at Disney, it's the first thing they start with is they start with purpose. They don't start with function. They don't say, mm -hmm. you know, this is how you're going to scan a ticket or this is how you're going to check a bag or this is how you're going to run a ride. Mm -hmm. They don't get to that until, you know, almost like weeks into your tenure at the organization. They start with purpose. They said, this is what we're all here to do, which is Disney is about creating happiness. So everything goes back to that, right? So if you run into a situation where you don't feel like you're creating happiness, you gotta stop and you gotta evaluate that situation. Mm -hmm. And then you have to change and, and take action or, or, or whatever it is. So I think um, organizations in general should start with purpose, but it's not just about mm -hmm. slamming something up on a wall and going, you know, we want to create some happiness. Okay, now get back to your desk. Start smiling. Yeah, yeah. So you have, you have, you have yeah. to drive it through your leadership. Your leaders have to be um, driving purpose every day, right? They have to be, and, and not just function. How many phone calls you make today, or if you're in sales, you know, you know, it, it needs to be driven from your leaders. It needs to be driven from your senior leaders, right? So how are they, you know, we used to talk about um, in, and when I worked for Turner Broadcasting, we used to work with senior leaders, and we'd say, you know, you need to go, um, you need to make your rounds, right? Like like doctors mm -hmm. do. And said, you you have to get out there with your staff. You have to get out there 
and make your rounds, which means you go from desk to desk, you ask people how they're doing, how are things going, get feedback, accept feedback, uh, and go make your rounds with, with staff. And I think you know these types of things are, are purpose-driven, right? Not just function, you're not out there to you know, check on people, you're out, you're out there to kind of check on their well-being and how they're doing. And, and I think so there's purpose, you know, if you don't, if they don't have purpose in an organization, you, you, you see it, right? You mm-hmm. feel it. Sure. Um, and it's everything's function driven. Then, you know, yeah, I, I would expect you have a lot of high turnover, you know, yeah. so it's very connected to, mm-hmm. to how your staff is doing and how they feel every single day. Are they, are they, you know, they walking away going, I feel like I've accomplished something today. Um, I've made a difference, mm-hmm. you know, whatever I'm doing. And, you know, a lot of us don't work in that world of like, I'm saving lives, right? Yeah. So Sorry, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge for organizations to find what is our purpose here? Oh, well, we, you know, we sell paper, you know? <laughs> There's a lot of organizations that sell out there that sell paper or, you know, I work at a grocery store. We sell people food or, you know, mm-hmm. substance or whatever it is. You have to dig down a little bit deeper into okay, what are we really here to do as an organization? Even if we're selling paper or we're selling, you know, um, groceries or, or whatever it is. So. Which brings me, you made me think about the fish program, which is about you know how people have a purpose, and and these guys are working on the fish or the meat counter, aren't they? And, and people would say, well, I'm just a fishmonger, or you know, I'm just uh, I'm, a, I'm a butcher type thing, but. It's more than that, isn't it? It's about <clears throat> we're going to give people a brilliant experience today. We're going to we're going to have to make some some light in somebody's life, and yeah. and this this team of people in that function, which most of us would probably think, oh, that's that's a little bit you know a little bit dull or this and the other. But actually, what's really happening is these people drive and understand the purpose of that business for their customer. And I think that's that's really really powerful just to pick up on that. And also, what you say with the purpose thing, I find really interesting is that exactly what you're saying which some organizations do and i've seen this and, and no doubt we all have is that there's normally a picture up of a few words yes we've done it we've got a purpose we've got some values but the key thing what you're saying is that's good but what you then need to do is make sure that we've got some intervention some learning or training intervention to get the people to understand and live and breathe and values and the only way you do that is your example with what you've said with disney where we forget function for now we're going to get them to understand what this organization is and what it custom is. One question it led to me before, I'm sure you've got a question as well, Tom, is that do you see any, and if so, what is it, but do you see any cultural differences between the US and the UK when it comes to guest services? I mean, there, there definitely is. I mean, I, and, and uh, even when I was at Wembley, there was this kind of big discussion about can our staff deliver that, right? Can our staff deliver uh, a great guest experience or fan experience? And I thought it was a ridiculous question. <laughs> I just did. It was, just, it was almost like, it was like saying that British people they're all like Mr. Can't Bean, do yeah, or Basil Fawlty, can't, <laughs> can't be friendly on a good day, right? Can't yeah. be friendly. Don't want purpose in their lives. I mean, that that's kind of what it was saying to me. Like they just they don't like people. You know, there these generalities of, of of the British culture. I think were ridiculous, and and I, it, it was a very difficult thing for me to even have a conversation about what you're, what people are saying. It's like, well, no, we can't do that. We, the, our, you know, our workforce can't deliver that. And you're just like, this is completely ridiculous. There's friendly, there's helpful, there's people that want purpose in every culture, right? You'd have to go find them, mm-hmm. right? You have to go find them. And even in, in the United States, not everybody needs to work in a customer facing role. Mm-hmm. Actually, most people don't. Yeah. Right. You have to go find them. So even at the Braves, it wasn't just like we took every application. Everybody gets to work for the Braves. That's not how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. We choose who the right people are to work in in this in this role. And I remember we used to have doctors and lawyers. I know that sounds crazy. Wanted to come work as an usher or a steward, Mm -hmm. but they wanted to have that connection. And we would say, unfortunately, you don't have the right skills to come Mm -hmm. work here. And they'd be like, well, I'm a doctor. (laughs) I know you're a doctor and you can go save lives. Yes. But here you don't have the right skills to work with a fan or a guest or, or help them, you know, on their journey or help them have a great experience or engage with kids or whatever it is. You just, it's not the same skill set always. Uh, you, we did have doctors and we did have lawyers and they had their, they had those skills too. Yeah. But so in this environment, I think it's completely ridiculous to say yeah. we can't. And now I think it's about organizations setting expectations, right? Mm-hmm. So even if you go on the supermarket, you go into a Waitrose versus a Sainsbury's or 
going to a Pret versus Acosta. It's about the organization setting that standard yeah. about um, you know whether or not this is important, whether or not we expect you. I went to Wimbledon last week, so you can lucky see it. Man. Lucky man, you can see lucky. it, right? And 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 they might not always execute it, execute it yeah. the, properly. I, we were we were went to a bar and the, the you know the I, behind there they were talking about oh we're running out of change and all this sort of stuff. And you're like okay, and then they would come up to you and they would say, you know, how's your day going? How you know, is this your first time ever at Wimbledon? And you knew that they had been scripted yeah. to, to engage. So mm-hmm. at least, you know, at least you're saying it's important that you engage with the customer, right? Yeah. Ask, them, ask them a couple questions or, or whatever, even if they don't execute it, right? All the time where maybe seals, seems a bit fake. Yeah. But anyways, I, I appreciated it, yeah. right? I appreciate that someone is trying to learn about, you know, my journey or my, you know, why am I there? And, and so... I think that's a great answer, and I, I think almost everyone who would be sat around this would be interested because it's very much a perception. I'd suggest in the UK that the US and Canada, to a lesser or greater extent, are pretty good with customer facing roles. But I think what you've said there, of course, it's not like that. Some people are totally unsuitable for that role, yeah. and it's going to be more or less the same in the UK yeah. find those people develop them and that was a really interesting way of framing it and a really positive answer from my viewpoint but there's still going to be those slight nuances mm. coming over to the UK did you see anything that good gracious that would be great for the Braves you know and it's so in between the you know the Basil Faulties did you see <laughs> did you see anything regularly that you thought that's great or anything you were doing at Wembley or even when you were at Wimbledon that would be a takeaway to your previous role well, I mean, I think there, there's things that you you see even at, like at Wimbledon, right? At the way that that um, Wimbledon takes care of people that are waiting for tickets mm-hmm. in the queue, right? Yeah. And they manage that process mm-hmm. and that experience, yeah. You know, down to every specific, um, you know, piece of, of how that experience works. Mm-hmm. I think di- that's very what you would see at Disney, right? Where Disney would look at every single from your when you're driving in. Mm-hmm to park your car, they're looking at every single experience as a Wimbledon, you can really see that they even, you know, if you think about it, it's a guest that might not even get in to your venue, right? Yeah. And you're saying you're still important. Yeah. We want you to walk away and go back to wherever you came from and tell people about what your experience was like, even if you don't get in or you don't get court one tickets yeah. or whatever it is. So I think it's, it's looking at, at that attention to detail. It's about really sitting down and going, how do we want the customer to feel? How do we want them to feel when they come to visit us? And and looking at the detail of that, and then going, well, what staff can help us deliver that experience, right? Yeah, I I could talk to you a long time Matt, about things you've touched on there, creating the best possible customer experience, and I think that plays across so many industries, and it would kind of help me or anyone else at any level, any size of organisation, I'm sure. Um, make what they do that bit better. But I do want to move the conversation forward mm. a bit more from here and look a bit more closely about what you're doing today. Yeah, uh, and absolutely. talk a bit about maybe um, Moonshot and where it is at the moment and where it might go over the medium term um, to the long term uh, and find out kind of what inspired you to make that step. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would, uh, again, I, I think anything uh, in all things, you're always going to get my honest answer. Um, and so... Please don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have said I would have never... Yeah, I would have never thought that I'd be running a, what I would call a very small company. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've always thrived in organizations because mm-hmm. I, I, I love being in an organization. I love, mm-hmm. you know, the the Disney and the... You know, we all have a common purpose here and we're all, we're all going after that every single day. So... Um, Moonshot came out of you know the FA and Wembley experience where you know really it wasn't going in the direction where I thought I could um, I could support it right mm-hmm. and so I had to find another way to to um, you know be have a purpose in my life from a career uh, career perspective um, and I also you know in the United States you know every stadium every venue you know has this director of guest services or vice president of fan experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but over here, it's very different, right? I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't see, you know, these things popping up on LinkedIn, you know? Yeah. The, the, I think Tottenham, I think something popped up there, right? It disappeared very quickly. <laughs> when, 
once they maybe found out what it was, right? So, you know, th this was kind of out of, well, you know, I just moved my kids over here mm. and I don't want to now pull them out of school. I don't want to be like we're in a mili the military. Mm. So, you know what, we're going to take a shot at seeing if there's organizations out there um, that want to, you know, focus in on the things that we, we think we can support them on. Um, it, it, ha it has, you know, in our infancy has been, uh, you know, U.S. brands like the NFL, you know, Major League Baseball. But there also have been some um, British brands, you know, like Farnborough and England Hockey and um, some of these that, that said, you know what, we, we want our fan to have um, a connection, right? Cricket World Cup. Cricket World Cup. Yeah. We want our fans to feel this way. We want to have that focus on our frontline staff member and make them, give them a purpose in, in what they're doing for us. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how Moonshot came about. It was, you know, it was out of, I, unfortunately I have to leave Wembley. I didn't want to, but I had to. And now, you know, I gotta find something else to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and that role of vice president of fan experience, yeah. I'm still looking for it. But mm -hmm. it's just not, it's, it just hasn't turned the corner yet. And I would, you know, even though we look at the United States, even the US, even when I was starting baseball, we were still just turning that corner on, mm -hmm. you know, what does it mean here, guest experience, fan experience. So I, I do think it's coming. And I do think it's, you know, it's going to, it's, it's, it's going to arrive mm -hmm. and it's going to turn that corner and it's, um, you'll have the vice president of fan experience or mm -hmm. guest experience or whatever it is, not just at like theme parks, yeah. right? At every big venue, every great big event will have that where they're looking at the, the detail of that fan experience and, and how do we deliver that? Well, we deliver it through our front line. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we get them ready to deliver it? How do we pick the right people? what resources they need to deliver that experience. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating with Moonshot is you've also, so obviously your purpose and your driver for that at the time, but you've also found a niche in them frontliners because obviously in the UK we're very safety conscious, aren't we? Not saying the US is not, of course it is, but from a point of view of we, we tend to put safety before anything else and, and actually you could argue safety and, and the fan experience needs to be on a similar level because if we get that communication right, then safety should naturally not be an issue. So it's quite interesting that you've you've found that gap in, in quite a tough British market to succeed with all these big brands, international and local brands, and be part of that. So, I mean, from your side, now that you're a couple of years down the line, how does that feel that you've worked and you've produced and you've, you've got yourself a, a marketplace and where people want you and, and want your, your your company, your brand. How does that feel at this point, bearing in mind you first set out, which is quite an entrepreneurial thing to do, wasn't it? Well, I guess, yeah, but once again, I, I, I never thought I would be in that situation. I didn't think, well, you know what, I'll work in sports for 15 years and then I'll go out and do, you know, my own thing. That mm -hmm. was never on the radar. It was, a, it was something that came about and sometimes, and I think this does go back to my, my, my um, you know, growing up, and my mom, her influence on kind of, you know, you go, you go out and you, you, you take whatever is in front of you and you just go after it, right? And sometimes you have to take risks. And I didn't do a risk assessment uh, before, uh, that, uh, before I did that. Um, one of my goals living in England is to not ever do a risk assessment. I know that's... Cut that, I know, I know, <laughs> cut that one out. But it, it is it's quite. Good. It is one of those things where you know sometimes when you do look too much at what what risk am I taking here, you'll just never jump, right? So I, you know, I, I think it's it's been an experience for me. It's been you know you, running your own small 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 company is is daunting, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're doing. You you know every everything is new. Mm -hmm. Every single from you know from accounting to website design to yeah. what, why would I be doing this stuff, yeah. <laughs> right? And so everything's new. You just have to have that, you know, you have to have that um, ability to just kind of drive and say, you know what, I'm going to figure it out as I go along and hopefully at the end of it be able to, you know, support my clients in the way that they want to be supported. And, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, I think we're accomplishing mm -hmm. that. Uh, it is a niche. I mean, mm. you know, we, the, our clients who we're working with, um, you know, it is, you know, you do have Cricket World Cups of the world, which is one-off tournaments, mm. um, but you also have the NFL, who's here every year and have been here for 12 years. Major League Baseball is now starting 
uh, here in the market. Um, but I think the fans want to, you know, they, they want a better experience. Mm. You know, we've talked about um, some experiences we have. I, you know, I have season tickets for a club I'm not going to mention. But let's say they're in North London and they don't have a new stadium. <laughs> and I, I find it very challenging to go there. And I, I just find it very challenging because I, I see everything. Yeah. I, I see, I hear everything. They should pay me to go <laughs> But it's very challenging because exactly. even with my kids, you know, when, kids, when, I, when I worked in baseball, the staff knew my kids. Yeah. Right? And not just because I worked there, they knew all the kids. I don't they know how you go out, Matt, because you can't go to certain <laughs> sports events because they're not done right. You can't go and see new Disney movies because you're part of the old one and it was so good. You're going to, yeah. I struggled here. <laughs> it's a fantastic hotel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. I, and, and, sorry, Tom, but I think, I think it's a really interesting point because I myself find myself, and I wonder if it's because when, when you do try and teach, train people how to offer a fantastic service, I wonder that your consciousness is so heightened that you see things more than the general public, that actually the, the base value of mine is aligned to the consumer, which is, give me an experience. Yeah. I'm, I'm spending this amount of money. Just give me a please and thank you. Just, just be timely, get to me quickly and you know, tell me what's going on. Yeah. Don't shrug your shoulders and go, oh, and grunt. Yeah. You know, when, you're, when you're paying good money to have a bit of diet time yourself. So, Maybe that's that's probably one of them drivers there, which which again is quite interesting, isn't it? That you can pick up on them things, and although I would agree with you in a lot of aspects as well, that you know I think the UK could do a lot more in that respect. But I think going back to your situation there, where you were talking about moonshots and how you set up, to me that suggests that's quite entrepreneurial spirit um, from you, from driven from your mum, from what you're saying. Look, let's just do this. Let's not get bogged down in the detail of risk assessments, but. Can you share with us any more other skill sets that you've personally, professionally had to go through along that journey to get you through to where you've got, which is a success, right? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would say that we're, you know, we're, uh, we're successful now, right? But like any business, you know, and I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a, a reader of business books because I'm not, mm. um, but, you know, you always have to be um, improving, you have to be innovating, you have to... You, you have to change the way that you're doing things. I mean, you know, um, you, you have to learn finance. You have to learn these things that I, I failed in university. I mean, I took a class in economics. I didn't do very well. <laughs> but you know what? I'm, I'm a different type of learner. I'm a learner as you go along, right? Not from a book. So, <laughs> you know, you learn these things as you, as you go through this process that um, – this you you learn things differently right and I think we've talked about this before there's different types of learners and they're different uh, how you how you learn things and and that's uh, that's uh, I've, I've learned that going through this uh, this process of, of trying to start something mm. you know bringing on bringing on staff when, when's the right time to grow mm. no idea you know so it's it's everything is challenging and, and everything is a is a, a a risk right yeah. everything's a jump into something and one of the things I like you said there just briefly is, is change and being able to adapt to that and I think there's some research out there I don't know how old it is now but it's one that sticks with me which is um, eight out of ten businesses go bust within the United Kingdom because they don't deliver the customers expectations in other words they have a good price they have a good product um, you know they've got good marketing they're out there but they forget about how they adapt to the customer and how they change. And, and that's certainly something that I've learned as well, that, you know, that is so true, isn't it? That you know, if, you, if you're not prepared to change and adapt, not only with environment factors, technology factors, and what the consumer wants, then you're at risk, are you? Yeah. As an organization, for anybody. Yeah, and I mean, for us, I mean, our, our, you know, our, our end client is the, the frontline staff member, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a client, who you're, you're working with, but they, you know, they want you focused in on the, the frontline staff member who's focused in on the guest. Mm. So we have to make sure that we're doing what that frontliner sees mm. as valuable, that they, that how, how are we engaging with them? How are we inspiring them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not inspired, then they're not going to deliver, you know, for that fan or that guest and, and your client is going to go, well, they didn't really pull it off, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're having to deliver something 
you have to find a way to engage with those people and get them inspired, mm -hmm. which is challenging because mm -hmm. you're working with so many different types of people. Mm -hmm. they, they all get inspired differently. Mm -hmm. They all see the world differently and you're trying to change their mindset or get them to think differently about what they're, they're mm -hmm. there to do. And listening to you today, Matt, while you talked about what you do with great humility, I can see straight away that's one of your great strengths to have built up what you've done there. And I really want to ask a few more questions about how someone who had those kind of needs within their organisation might get in touch. But before then, I think we should at least consider oh. the, the, the core of today's podcast, which is the Beat the Griff competition. Beat the Griff. Beat, Beat the, the Griff. griff. But before we come on to that, <laughs> I, I know you're keen to get It's to all I've been point. thinking about. It's it is. About. And I've got one final question for yeah. you, and I think this is um, really going to be hopefully profound for the viewers, which is put yourself in the mindset of that 18-year-old again, um, or people you know that are at that age bracket now, and then all the way through that spectrum to the CEO, the managing director, which you are yourself of your organisation. And, and it could be the same, it could be different, but... In today's world, in today's market, what sort of advice would you be giving to that 18-year-old or chief exec in regard to skill sets that they need now to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think um, if I if was go back to when I was 18, I remember my, my mom gave me some advice that I, I would still share with anyone who asked me, which is, if you really want something, if you really want to work for a certain company or you really want to do something in your life and, you know, you're struggling to do that, you can always offer to work for free. And people have find it very difficult to turn you down if you're willing to work for free, right? Now, they can't legally, <laughs> in most <Not> countries, <laughs> uh, employ you without paying you, right? Mm. But uh, I can tell you one thing, if anyone ever emailed me or called me and said, listen, I wanna work for Moonshot, or I wanna, I wanna you know, we'll work for some of your clients, and, and if they said, you know what, I'll work for free, I, okay, you're on. You're on, you're on the team, right? Because mm. if someone's passionate enough, mm -hmm. if they're, they're willing to, you know what, uh, go that extra step, mm. right? So some, if I was 18, right, and I really wanted something, and, and you know, that was some, some advice my mom gave me, mm. and I'm sure I used that at mm. some point. I can't remember exactly the example where I told that employer, I'll just work for free, just give me a job, mm. right? Terrible. And I think, you know, if you're willing, if that, you're that passionate about what you want to do in your life, you want to, you know, work for that sports team, or you want to, whatever, whatever it is, you have to be willing to go that extra, you know, that extra, um, extra little bit, right? Which is interesting in today's world, that interns, for an example, yeah, unpaid, are actually quite huge. Yeah. For that reason, to demonstrate your skill sets. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And from a point of view of a chief exec, is there anything that sticks out in your mind that one skill that you think a chief exec must have from your experience of who you've seen? Who you've I've seen really good ones and really bad ones. <laughs> yeah. I think we probably all have, right? Yeah, Where you're yeah. just like, wow, yeah. like, you know, that's a leader. And they say, you know, they say you leave a job because you're a leader, right? Mm. Now it might be your immediate leader, it might be your senior leader. Um, but and just I would, on that, sorry, just on that, yeah. ninety percent of people in the UK leave their role because of their manager stroke leader, um, and that they're not happy with them. That's a massive statistic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think people aren't leaving the job? Yeah, leaving the person. Yeah, because the leader is the one that's there to support them, provide them with that professional development. Mm -hmm. Where am I going here? Mm -hmm. Right? What's my purpose? Mm -hmm. Every day you get that from your leader. Mm -hmm. And if your leader's not doing that, then you're, you're kind of purposeless, mm -hmm. right? I, I would say from a, a CEO perspective, you know, you have to know people. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a great CEO, you have to know people. You have to know how to manage every type of different type of person. You have to know, know what are their strengths? How can we build on those strengths? You have to be able to make the rounds. You got to be able to walk around and talk to people and find out what's going on, not in their work lives, but in their lives. Mm. And I think if you look at companies that are successful, really successful, if you look at their CEO, they're either, they're, they're doing all that stuff and they're driving it down, right? Through their senior leaders, through their leaders, all the way down. Um, but they're, they're, they're providing that a place where you feel like you have a purpose here, right? Mm -hmm. And people are, are treating you with care and respect and professionalism and you know where you're going, right? You know what your what you know what it looks like in a couple of years. You know, you know what that is. And you have the freedom to 
to accomplish, right? Mm-hmm. You're not kind of being stuck. But I think as from a CEO level, I think you have to have that ability to, you know, is to to connect with people. Super. Yeah, you got to great, be strategic, all that sort of stuff. But you got to be able to do that. Superb, and, and, and I, I would agree with you one hundred percent. Having seen specific leaders who are fantastically, you know, I always think to myself, what is it that a chief exec does? And I'm thinking a medium large organization. What is it they really do? What skill sets they really want? And for me, it's always come back to that people piece and being able to delegate and manage them people and drive yeah. about cultures, yeah. um, rather than other facets, which are still important. Yeah, but it depends I'll, on the culture. I'll quickly give you one example. So when I when I opened Lion King twenty years ago, yeah. The opening night, there was a party afterwards, and everybody was there, right? Elton John was there, and uh, the, one of the Disney, um, Roy Disney Jr. was there. Everybody was there. We went to this party, and I had worked at Disney in Florida, and Michael Eisner was our CEO, mm-hmm. right? And so I saw Michael Eisner across the room at this party because our GM had given us tickets to go. And I was like, I got to go. I got to go, right? I have to go. <laughs> And talk to this guy, right? He's the CEO of the Disney company. Who's and now CEO of Portsmouth Football Club, is that well, right? Well, that's right. Well, I think his son in, in, is involved, but I think he's yeah, a part owner or something yeah, like that. Something like that yeah. So uh, I said to Fausto, my Italian, he was head doorman at the theater. I said, we're going to talk to Eisner. <laughs> and so we were taking champagne, we're chugging champagne, and we're, like, we're trying to get the courage to go up yeah. to the CEO of Disney. So we go up to him, and I'm thinking, I don't know, you don't know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. You're just like, this guy could shoo you away. He could be like, shh, just go away or call security, yeah. get these guys out of here, right? 22 or whatever. And what he did was something I'll never forget, right? Mm. I, I said, uh, Mr. Eisner, of course, you, I didn't call him Michael. Yeah. But I said, Mr. Eisner, I just wanted to introduce myself. I you know, worked at Epcot, but now I'm over here working at Lion King. And he said, and I said, my name's Matt. He said, hey, Matt, I'm, I'm Michael. He said, and then he, and he, said, he called his wife over. Mm. He, he called his wife over and said, Jane, yeah. that's her name. I still remember it. Uh, yeah. Jane, come over. Come over and meet Matt. That's class. Matt's living in London, but he worked at Epcot. Mm-hmm. And he spent about 10 minutes with me. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's mm-hmm. a leader, right? Yes. That's a leader that says, you know what? People are important. Even mm-hmm. this one guy who's you know, tearing tickets on the door at Lion King, who used to work in one of my parks mm-hmm. right in Orlando, this guy's mm-hmm. important. I'm going to take the time, spend some time with him. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring my wife over from across the room. That's that's leadership, right? Mm-hmm. And that's I still tell that story. It was twenty years ago, and that still made an impact on me. Uh, from what what a lead, leader is. I mean, this is bigger Incredible. one of the biggest CEOs Incredible. in the world, right? Super, yeah. Matt. Well said. Well said. And thank you for sharing. You, we we could talk to you all day because you you're quite open. You've got great insights, and I think Tom's itching to get into. Beat the Griff. Beat the Griff. That's all we've all been he's, thinking about. He's this. dying to get yeah. going on this show. That's all I came here for. <laughs> That's, uh, in the spirit well, of uh, quizzes. Let me let me tell my story. We've heard the one about my eyes there. And, uh, I'll tell you the story about the, the, <laughs> the evolution of Beat the Griff. So the starting point was to print out a big picture of Graham's face, which I got from his uh, pod learning website. But I printed it out. I backed it on cardboard here. Yeah. So I stuck it down and just printed it there. So... Blue Peter stuff, and then I put these eye holes and did it much them. You jammed me, like he'd, he'd let me down or something. And then, but then I realised it didn't really relate to it. So we just got, <laughs> we've just got the questions. We've just got the questions. Next. All right. So, yeah, there's no connection with sad, the questions and that. But, but it's still, I've got it away altogether. You've got a real one side clip. Yeah, yeah. should have risk assessed for the. Anyway, <laughs> the, the just the questions. The questions is first to three. Okay. First to three. I'm going to start with Graham because he's he had a really bad. Episode recently where <sighs> oh, we won't go there. I, I, tried I, to I don't want to chance, but anyway, these are general knowledge questions. If you answer the question incorrectly, it's passed over. It's first to three. Are you ready, go? I'm ready. Here we go. Here we go. Buckle up. Oh, by the way, I don't know anything about these questions as always. Which I do not believe. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely do not. I haven't it. got a clue on what sort of questions. But I think you even know the questions, and I think you're still going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> How brilliant is that? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Come on, don't, don't be seen. Can't, can't quite read your writing Come on. on this first one. Right, okay, <laughs> the plaque is the oldest quarter of which city? Is it A, Athens, B, Prague, C, Rome, or D, Vienna? I'm going to go with Rome. Wrong. What? Very, well, just wrong. Plain wrong. Just wrong. <laughs> Mike, you get the same question. We've only got three possible answers now. I'll read it again. Same question. <laughs> same question, but... <laughs> Graham's <laughs> taken out one what, of them. What did, 25%. What did you guess, Graham? I went Rome. I should have said something else then, shouldn't You could have, but I you didn't think that quickly, so there we are. And I knew you wouldn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being mean, I should do that. Right. The plaque was the oldest quarter of which city, Mike? Is it Athens, Prague, or Vienna? 
I'm gonna go with Prague. Well, really? See, I think <laughs> Prague. The second one. The placard is the oldest quarter of which city is it A Athens or B Vienna? Well, it's got to be Athens. Like what points Graham Morgan? Yes. Yes. Woo! Get so, I mean, you know, come on. Okay. Fifty-fifty shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to build him up. You know, We've got to help him develop. So. Mike, this is your question now. What is an axolotl? Is it A, a nerve in the brain, B, a multi-axle vehicle, C, a type of mortise lock, or D, a species of salamander? Uh, I'm going to go with C, which I don't remember what it was. It was a type of mortise lock, and Mike, you are... No incorrect. way! He's, I said incorrect. incorrect. That means wrong. Oh, right. Okay, so you get the same one. So Graham, what is an axolotl? Is it A, a nerve in the brain, B, a multi-axle vehicle, or D, a species of salamander? Species of salamander. Well done, you're right. Yeah. You yes. Well, there so was a different it, it, in his voice. He changed his voice, so he, he did. did. He did give a tell there. He said to do that, though. He said yeah. for him. <laughs> for him, yeah. But we the more monotone for Mike. We have disclosed and de declared the bribery act. By the way, you know we fulfilled that duty throughout. Question three. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> you got it. Just keep three. going. Great, it's your one. The Panama Canal was officially opened by which U.S. president? Ooh. Was it A, Calvin Coolidge, B, Herbert Hoover, C, Theodore Roosevelt, or D, Woodrow Wilson? Oof, well, Woodrow well you've probably got an advantage on this, so I'm going to go with... I'm Canadian. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with the second one. Remind me the second one again. Herbert Hoover. Hoover, I'm going to go for, yes. Wrong. Okay. <sighs> Mike, same question. Coolidge. Was it? No. Great. <laughs> oh. 50-50, you've got nearly half of the 50-50 questions right, Graham. Yeah, you're right, really right, good right, on this. Right, the Panama right. Canal was officially opened by which US president? C, Theodore Roosevelt, or D, Woodrow Wilson? I've got to go with Theodore. Well, that means, Mike, you get a point by default. Yes. Cause and you have a tell again. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm not catching it's the not tell not. the first time. <laughs> I couldn't read Wood, Woodrow Wilson because it was correct. But no, I so no chance. So it's, it's two on three. Or it's, well, it's, it's two on to me. It's two on to you. I've lost track of whose question Matt it is. Matt one, grain two. I thought this was a race to the station. <laughs> it's <probably laughs> is a running race. It will be, but it's just because you get so tired of the quiz that you run away to the station to try and get away from it. Right, I'm going to ask Matt this question regardless of whose turn it is, but I believe it's Matt's. In which opera did Maria Callas make her last appearance at Covent Garden? Oh a, Carmen, B, Tosca, C, Madame Butterfly, or D, La Bohème? La Bohème? No. You can say it, but I can't. I was just I was making sure yeah. you said it right. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Even though you knew the answer, you um, were... I'm going to go with Butterfly. No. Ah, you got Carmen or Tosca? Uh, Tosca. Yes. No way! So, um, this is we're going to get a winner. We're going to get oh a winner. God. We've had our first fist bump of the whole series. This Come is on. good. All oh, right. Question. If I lose, I'm just going <laughs> to... <laughs> everything's going. Yeah, everyone does that. But it's, um, does that. it's fine. It's your specialist Come on. subject. Great. What's that sport? The Bible. Oh, ready. Right. Ooh. Okay. After Adam, E, Cain and Abel, who is the next person mentioned in the Bible? Oh. Is it A, Enoch, B, Jubal, C, Lamech, or D, Zillah? I'm going to go with... It's one of two, so I'm going to go with Enoch. Uh, Graham, you're right. You were the quiz. Yes! Woo! <laughs> That's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Davies, for a wonderful round. I'm oh, delighted. Come on. I don't, know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's the sort of worst sort of answer to any quiz in history because yeah. we, we won this. I thought it was going to be a Disney animated films or something. Should we focus on this? That's next episode. When we're gone. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway, David, so we're going to wrap up now, a few more a few more moments to wrap up. And whilst we do that, what we'd like to ask Matt is to just share for a moment or two your final thoughts on today's discussion for the benefit of our viewers, all spectrums of, of in the workplace, at all levels, um, from a people organisation development point. And then obviously we'll, we'll get some feedback from Tom and we'll start wrapping up there and, and go from, from that aspect. So from what we've discussed here today, what, what's your thinking as a final thought for our viewers to go away with and make sure that they can try and obviously... Action. Well, number one is don't leave your job until you have a new job. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I broke that rule. No, but, but it worked. Yeah, but yeah, it did work. But no, you shouldn't do that. Maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, do a risk assessment before you leave. No. Um, you know, I think if you're passionate about something, you should be willing to do, you know, work for free to do that job, right? 
or, or go in that direction. And I think that's, that's some, 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 good, uh, some good advice. But I would also say if you're in something, you're working, and you don't have that purpose-driven work life, then find out how you're getting out of it, right? And strategically find out you know, what you're going to do in the next couple months to move into something else. Because we all should be in, in and working in something that's going to give us, give us that purpose every single day that we are, are working. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, it's, you know, it's a challenging, but if you really want something, then you will, you will do what you have to do to get into, to that, you know, um, that field. Of course, I mean, I, I get a lot of, um, you know, hits on LinkedIn and, and, um, you know, emails from people, but very rarely are they willing to go to that, that next level. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you really want something, then you, you have to find out, well, how do I really, cause there's so, we all, right. We're all on LinkedIn. You get hit by the most ridiculous, you know, things. I always try to respond if someone, you know, even if it's just a, a, a message back. But if you really want to work in this industry or that industry and you're really reaching out to somebody, you need to be able to, you know, take it to that next level of how you're going to get your foot in the door, which is, you know, you got to figure out what that is. But hmm. working for free is not, it's not as a good, uh, some good <laughs> advice. <laughs> that would make anybody open their eyes, right? Yeah, it's fascinating. In particular, the younger generation coming in to get that experience that they need, which we were all at in our careers. How do you get that experience? It's really tough. And we actually did low-paid jobs, which were potentially minimal amount of money anyway. It didn't really pay for anything, but to get us going to get that point. So thanks for sharing, Matt. Superb. Tom, for you to wrap up, what's your thoughts on, on our well, wonderful I, guest today? I think it challenged a lot of my kind of preconceptions. I mean, the kind of internships and working for free it's had a bit of bad press I suppose in mm. the UK saying you know it, it, it doesn't really um, enable across the board however I almost prefer my view on it you can decide where you want to go with it if something's not quite right you've got to you've got to challenge you've got to find your way out and it doesn't matter how if you want it enough that's your starting point and then you backfill it and I think yeah. for me that's that's really powerful for you know, this, I think there's times most people who've been working for, a, you know, a good number of years will have felt mm -hmm. like that. And then where do I go? How do I make that change? So that's great. And the powerful story about kind of meeting my guys for the first mm -hmm. time, well, I'm not going to forget that one. And yeah. uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great kind of tale of what leadership involves. So that's something I won't forget. So thank you, Mike. Really insightful. And like I said, I think you've delivered your message in a in your your own really engaging style i suppose my question to finish with is if someone does have kind of a team um, of people that they think would benefit from what moonshot's offering at the moment what would be the best way to contact you you've mentioned linkedin there you've seen yeah absolutely i mean we, we we're all uh on linkedin you can get, go to our website mm -hmm. um we have a weird website but this is because our kids will also not be able to find email addresses yeah um, it's www.mshot.co. Don't go yeah. any further than that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And how, yeah, <laughs> where, where do you get that website from? The, the .co ones, it's dot company. Yeah, that's, that, eventually yeah. there'll just be a dot. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. Our kids will be like something yeah. at dot. Yeah. Because yeah. there'll be no coms yeah. or co's or dot yeah. co dot uks. Or, it's funny, isn't it, really? As things move on and then the next generation comes through and points out something's it. peculiar. I mean, I going back maybe ten years. Um, we were. I was in the school environment. I was working as a maths teacher, and um, I was sick of kind of battering against the phones. I was really strict, and no one must get the phone. I don't want to see him. I'll take him away. Da -da 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 -da. Got to the end of term, and we had a kind of older group in. I put all the notes on the board, all the formulas they needed to learn. I said, "Listen, you can all get your camera phones out now and take a picture <laughs> of all the formulas on the board." He said, "Sir." you mean you can take our phones out? No one says camera phones. They've all got cameras on them there. And that was just an example of it moving away. And I had the same thing with it. Go to www.bbc. Yeah. So you yeah. can just say BBC. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and this has happened again. So it's yeah, just yeah, three so, W's. Yeah, that's it. You can can't do that. But, but no, to bring it back around. Thank you so much, Matt. I think it was, mm -hmm. you've been a great guest and uh, some takeaways there. Superb. Thanks, Tom. So just to wrap up, thank you to our trusted lieutenant in Tom Davis and our guest speaker, Matt Lynch. Hopefully that's been useful. Um, if you need to give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate that and we want to go through your comments. So obviously you'll be able to see this episode on YouTube channel. As much feedback as possible. What we're looking for is after 12 episodes, we potentially can do a live event and we want you to judge who our three best guest speakers are so we can invite them to come and join. 
So keep going with your people organisation development. And until next time, thank you very much and see you soon. Take care.